Okay. My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. And today I am delighted to welcome another esteemed guest to help us throw more light on the issues affecting women with suspected or confirmed heart disease. Barbara Shaw studied archaeology and geography at Leeds University and later in her career worked as charity CEO and has been a trustee of Citizens Advice, which is one of the largest charities in England and Wales. Barbara is passionate about strengthening the voice of people and ensuring that their needs and experiences are considered as an integral part of commissioning and delivery of healthcare services. Barbara has spent the past 25 years working with people with disabilities and long-term health issues, ensuring the access that they get to the help that they need to allow them to lead active and fulfilling lives. Barbara also brings her own patient experience as a woman living with a complex heart condition and autoimmune disease. And she's also one of the founding members and trustees to a new, uh, charity which deals with women and heart disease. It's called Women's Heartbeat, which aims to support women with heart disease. So welcome, Barbara. It is a privilege for me to have the chance to speak with you. Right. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Okay. Could you start off by telling me about your experience of first developing symptoms and then being diagnosed and finally living with a heart condition? Uh, and did you find that being a woman, your journey has been very different to what it may have been had you been a man? Um, well, I've had a history over the past number of years, a considerable number of years of having irregularities with my heart and uh, they were mainly kind of associated with um, uh, being given certain medications and the uh, first time that I remember was when I was um, being induced with my second child and that sent my heart off into all sorts of crazy um, crazy beats and I had arrhythmia and uh, then again, I've had a couple of other instances where similar sort of things happen, mainly in association with medications. And I had a number of tests done um, and they couldn't find anything. And so I was just told, you know, OK, there's nothing wrong with you. It must be just, you know, um, an aberration, you know, go away and you'll be OK. And so um, in January, in January 2019, no, what am I saying, in 2014, sorry, I was off work because I'd had a, a problem. I've had a lifelong back problem because I had a back fracture when I was young. And I'd been off for quite a long time and then I'd come back to work. And at the time I was, um, you know, I was managing, I was the CEO of two charities um, at the same time. And I spent a lot of time rushing around from one, one organization to another. And um, funnily enough, I was in a meeting with a lot of health professionals and uh, I suddenly started getting chest pains and I went out of the meeting for a while and started to feel better. So I thought that's okay, carried on with my day, went on to more meetings, <laughs> went home. And then the following day, uh, sort of half past five in the morning, the chest pains came back and I said to my husband, I think I really need to go and get this checked out. So um, I was taken off to the local hospital and I said to my husband at the time, oh, it's just another false alarm. It's just another thing where they're not going to find anything and I'll be back soon. You know, go away <laughs> and I'll ring you when uh, you need to come. And then the next thing I knew, they said that I was having a heart attack and that I needed to be rushed off. I was blue lighted down to the the main hospital program and uh, I could see on the screen because they showed everything to me at the time that I had no um, plaque in my in my main arteries at all and my heart was beating in an unusual um, way which they put down to um, Takasubo syndrome and then I was told I mean I was in IU for 48 hours and I felt a bit of a fraud actually I kept thinking oh I need to go home what am I doing here you know it's time I went back to do all the things that I need to do in my life and um, 
I was told by the, um, the cardiologist that I was extremely lucky and this was something that I didn't need to worry about at all and I would be better in two weeks time and I'd be able to go back to work and, and I was given a follow up um, a few weeks later and again it was sort of my symptoms, my ongoing symptoms pain was just dismissed and I was told right you'll be fine don't worry you know there's nothing else that we need to do for you. And it was only because, you know, I suppose partly to do with my work, I'm, I don't like being sort of brushed off. So I thought, right, I've got to do something about this. And so I did my own research into Takasubo syndrome. Who was out there who knew anything about it? And I came up with a person who I saw privately. And then I was referred on from there to the NHS. And so I now see my cardiologist through the NHS. And uh, um, it's six years now, and it has been an absolute roller coaster because I didn't get better. I continued to have shortness of breath. I couldn't walk upstairs. I couldn't climb a hill. I couldn't walk more than a mile without getting chest pains. And so six years later, you know, I was finally diagnosed with um, microvascular, coronary microvascular ischemia. And, uh, but on my journey, I was also diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and, uh, and um, I have unexplained tachycardias and all, all sorts of things that happen still. So I'm living with a sort of constant, you know, I think I call it a roller coaster. I mean, I'm nowhere near as fit as I was before I had my Takasubo. And, um, you know, I didn't fit any of the profiles that you would expect people to fit. I'm not overweight. I'm not diabetic. I don't drink. I don't smoke. You know, so I didn't really see myself as a sort of candidate for somebody who would have heart disease. So, um, yes, yeah, so it has been a real, a real difficult six years. I had to give up my job because there's no way that I could do that with the amount of chest pain that I was getting. And to be diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis at the same time, my, um, I applied for um, uh, early retirement on the grounds of ill health and left my work. And um, yeah, but obviously being a person who is very active I don't like to give up everything. So uh, I'm still sort of working in the background, doing other things to try and keep myself sane. Otherwise, you just kind of feel can't be another thing that's wrong with me. It cannot be another thing. And um, I mean, on top of all of that, um, and I think these things are all connected. I had, as I said, unexplained tachycardias. Then I got interstitial cystitis, which is another immune problem. And so <laughs> it's, it really has kind of progressed one thing after another after another. And each one, each thing that you get, it takes you a long time to come to terms with it and a long time to get an answer and a treatment. And, you know, uh, it, it's been very difficult. It's very interesting, you know, because I think the first thing is with Takotsubos, the general training that we receive is that Takotsubos is a condition that uh, affects sort of um, older women and the heart gets weak because of a release of a large number of stress hormones. And then after within three months, the heart recovers and they go back to normal. And that's the traditional thinking. And, uh, you know, and as doctors, certainly we are guilty of the fact that because the heart looks normal again on our test, we expect the patient to be normal. And if the patient says that they're not normal by then, then we disregard that and we rely on the test. We stop listening to the patient at that point and we say, well, the test is normal, so you must be either very anxious or you must be mad or there's something else going on, but we can't be wrong. And <laughs> And one of the problems here is that this is the whole issue, that we shouldn't be expecting patients to fit nicely into the boxes that we have created, but rather we should 
be listening to the patient and making a box appropriate for that patient. And I bet that what you found as a patient is you, you have all these other things going on at the same time and you are asking yourself, why now? Why has my life suddenly changed? And surely they must all be linked. And you go to a cardiologist and say, well, I'm only interested in your heart. I'm not interested in the rest of you. And then you go to someone else and then they'll say, oh, I'm only interested in your cystitis. I'm not interested in the rest of you. And this is one of the big problems where patients end up going from pillar to post and no one sees them as a whole person. Um, and I think that this is a real challenge in medicine because we've become so super specialized and we're only interested in our own agenda as doctors and not the patient's agenda. True, and um, he has look at me as a patient is, it's far too complicated. You know, you need to be going off to see all these other people. And you're quite right, they, they work in silos. They don't really sort of talk to each other. And I mean, I was very fortunate that I found a really good cardiologist who was prepared to refer me on to other specialists to look at whether or not um, a common thing with Takasubo would be that um, there was reduced estrogen in the system. And certainly that was true with me. And, uh, and to some extent that was causing some of my symptoms. And then I, was, I went on to HRT, which then helped. Um, and then I was referred on to a pulmonary specialist because of my shortness of breath. They couldn't find anything other than reduced gas transfer, but they picked up that I had um, huge levels of anti-CCP, which is a marker for rheumatoid arthritis. Then I was sent on to a rheumatologist, and then I was put on all sorts of medications, only to be told later, you haven't got any active rheumatoid arthritis, and we're, you know, we'll, we'll sign you off, and but you'll probably be back, you know, at some point in the future. So it's been so up and down, you know, one, you get old, right, you've got and you're going to be on drugs for the rest of your life, you know, and the next thing you're told, oh, well, no, no, we've had a case conference and we've decided that's not the case. But what we have discovered is, you know, we want you to go off to have some further tests. To have the tests for, um, for microvascular problems is quite difficult to get. It's not something that normally a cardiologist would say, this might be a problem with your the small vessels that are around your heart. Um, so there was a, I pushed for that. And of course, when I had all the tests done and they came back and showed that I did have coronary microvascular ischemia, my cardiologist said, the first thing he said to me was, this is not in your head. This is not as a cause of anxiety. This is not as a cause of stress. Your heart is not functioning in the way that it should be. And that is going to mean you're going to be living with this for the rest of your life. And by the way, we don't really know how to treat it. <laughs> we'll try you on different drugs. Let's try this one. And if that doesn't work, we'll try another one. If that doesn't work, we'll try another one. So um, all, all the way along, both with the Takasubo and the microvascular, um, I've tended to feel a little bit like a guinea pig. You know? And I think an awful lot of other women feel the same in that, in that situation because not enough research has been done into what types of medication and treatment could work well for women. Um, you tend on the whole to be given medication that has been tested on men um, from clinical trials where the main number of people in those trials are male and it's assumed rightly or wrongly that women's hearts ought to be the same as men but they're just a bit smaller so let's try you on this or this and invariably it doesn't work so um yeah so it's been difficult but for, for i guess i mean even though you know you get told that uh there is something wrong with your heart and you know, we don't know how to treat it. It still must be a relief to at least feel validated that someone is willing to accept the fact that it wasn't all in your head. And for a lot of people, a lot of women in particular, this is a major challenge, just trying to get some validation from a healthcare professional that hang on, you know, this, you're not just crazy and this is real. 
Yeah, oh no, absolutely. Because what happens is that when when you turn up to A and E and with chest pain and they can't find anything and they send you away and say, you know, are you stressed at the moment or are you feeling anxious? And then you start to doubt yourself mm-hmm. and you maybe start to think, well, maybe I'm bringing it on myself. Maybe, maybe it's, you know, this is not happening. Maybe it is all, all in my head. And you just want to be believed. You just want somebody, as you say, to validate there is actually something physically wrong with you. This is not a mental health problem. This is not because I'm highly strong or anxious or overstressed or any of those things. This is definitely a physical problem with your heart. So that was huge relief for me. I mean, absolutely huge relief just to know um, that, you know, it was actually a real problem, not something that was just an imagined problem. Do you think this is a bigger challenge for women than men? I do, actually, because I think, you know, generally with men, if they go to their GP and say they've got chest pain, it puts up lots of flags immediately. Right, okay, here we've got somebody who's in their 50s or 60s, looks a bit overweight, you know, has a few glasses of wine in the evening and, you know, sort of is complaining of chest pain. Right, okay, straight away, we'll send that person off to have an echocardiogram, we'll send them off to see a cardiologist. In no way would they be asked if they were stressed or, uh, well, are they anxious? Or, you know, have they got a gastric problem? And I mean, in my journey, I was passed from the, the sort of gastric department, you know, to the cardiology department, you know, backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and had, you know, invasive tests thinking that the problem was uh, um, to do with my gastric system, which it wasn't. And that's a common, that's a common misconception as well, that women are often, you know, told oh, it's maybe gastric, let's send you off and you can have some tests done. So um, I think the, fl- the same flags aren't there for women when they present with chest pain. It's not immediately thought that women um, could be having, could have heart disease. It's, it's immediately thought, oh, it's a woman. It's not, you know, I don't know why GPs don't flag it as a, as a problem when, you know, sort of, it's the leading cause of death in women, you know, sort of globally, but unfortunately they don't. So I do think it is very, very different for men and for women. I'm glad you mentioned the fact that it is the coronary disease, heart disease is the leading cause of death for women. Could you furnish me with some other kind of statistics or any existing evidence that there may be that highlights the disparity uh, between cardiac care for men and women? Well, there have been a number of um, pieces of research that have been undertaken, particularly one um, with Professor Gale at Leeds University, where he was actually looking at the gender disparity between men and women with heart heart disease. And his findings or the findings of that research showed that women had an increased risk of wrong diagnosis. Up to 50% of women, you know, are getting the wrong diagnosis. Well, you know, that... (laughs) 50% more women, I should say, are getting the wrong diagnosis compared with men. 34% of women are less likely to be given any, um, uh, any procedures to look at whether or not there might be underlying heart disease behind their condition. And they're 16% more less likely to be given any medication, even if it's just aspirin you know, or, or, or a beta blocker. So all the way along, I mean, women are, you know, sort of faring less well than men. And I think um, it's not really very well sort of um, uh, talked about that um, when women have a heart condition, they don't do as well as men. You know? And I, I talked earlier on about most of the clinical trials that have been undertaken are done around men and then medications are are prescribed for men 
and women, you know, sort of are then given those same medications and they don't always work. The, um, the, the amount of medication that you might get, you know, should be different or those medications just work, don't work with women because women have all sorts of other things that are going on at the same time that, you know, so that the men don't. And um, I know that um, uh, <clears throat> you're more likely to have a heart disease problem or a problem with your heart if you are menopausal or postmenopausal. And often that is connected with the reduction in the amount of estrogen in the system because, you know, when we're young and we're having children, that estrogen is there and protects women from an awful lot of conditions. And once the menopause comes, that estrogen levels reduce and, you know, that can be connected with, you know, certainly with heart disease. Absolutely. You're quite right. And there is so much misinformation out there about this and also things like HRT. You know, a lot of women I come across are very, very confused and, um, and they don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And uh, so clearly there needs to be a a lot better information, more reliable information being presented, but also uh, not amongst just the general public, but amongst healthcare professionals as well, that women are different. They present differently. Their risk factors are different. Um, so, I mean, given your experience, both as a patient and also your experience in the healthcare field, um, you have recently set up a new charity. Uh, which is largely uh, based around women with heart disease. And I was very interested in this because, I, as you know, there already exist a bunch of charities such as the British Heart Foundation for heart disease. What do you feel is the unmet need that is not being addressed by these um, already existing charities? And what are your hopes and aspirations for your charity? Well, I mean, there are some wonderful charities out there. The Heart Foundation and as well as the British Heart Foundation, there are other um, charities which tend to focus on a specific condition, um, like um, Cardiomyopathy UK. You know, all of these are really good charities, but they're not focusing specifically on women and you tend to find that a lot of the research that's being published is, you know, sort of um, not looking at the differences between men and women and how they present and their conditions and such like. I mean, what we want to do is we want to raise awareness um, for women of heart disease and that you don't have to have any of the so-called flags um, in order to become a potential, you know, sort of person who will have heart disease. I would never have put myself in that category whatsoever. And uh, so we want to let people understand that heart disease is the biggest killer of women in the UK. It is not breast cancer, which is what most people would think. So we want to do some myth busting, get lots of information out to people so they know how to be heart healthy and also to improve outcomes for women. And, you know, often because there is this gender bias, women need to stand up and speak for themselves because only we know how we, how we feel. We know our own bodies. We want to be listened to and we want um, the medical profession to take us seriously, to improve treatment for women to improve outcomes for women. And so as well as getting out information and trying to improve medical treatments and care, we want to advocate. We want to be a strong voice for women and advocate on their behalf and try and really make a difference. It's interesting. I was just thinking um, about what you were saying. And basically what you're saying is you don't have to look like a cardiac patient to have to be a cardiac patient. And at this point in time, the way a cardiac patient looks is he's, he's usually male, isn't he? So in our minds, yeah. that cardiac patient is usually male and we have to try and take away that bias in our own heads. Certainly I'm guilty of that. If I go to a party and I'm always sort of thinking of heart disease, et cetera. And if I see a bunch of overweight men smoking, I'm thinking, oh my God, they're, they're doing harm and these people are going to end up on my ward one day. 
but they may be similarly overweight women smoking. And I don't think that instinctually. I don't think, oh, you know, in my own mind, I'm biased incorrectly that heart disease is men. Uh, actually, heart disease is everyone. And I'm really glad that you're trying to draw more attention to it. Um, in terms of uh, specific conditions, are you, are you uh, aware of any or are you going to be highlighting any specific conditions that you feel are really poorly understood specifically for women, uh, but deserve a lot more attention? Um, well, I mean, we want to cover a whole range of issues because one of the things that I mentioned earlier is there are support groups and organizations out there that focus on a particular condition, but there are um, conditions that where the majority of people who are affected are women. Mm -hmm. And that could be coronary microvascular ischemia, which very little is known about. Mm -hmm. And very little research has been done on how to treat women. Nothing has been done to look at, as far as I'm aware, but there may be, there may be papers out there, the link between that and autoimmune problems. We want to sort of look at a whole gamut of conditions that women might have that may be linked into um, to heart disease. I mean, another condition which um, predominantly, but not entirely, um, affects women is acathuvose cardiomyopathy. And even now, despite the fact that um, uh, a lot more people in the medical, medical profession know more about it, women are still being told, right, they present, they have Takasubos, but they're told you'll be okay in, a, in two weeks time, the same as I was six years ago, you know, go home and think yourself lucky. So we really want, um, you know, sort of um, more information to come out about those specific conditions, which are specifically or more specifically related to women. And, uh, but we want the, the charity to be a general, charity around heart disease in women and uh, and not to focus too much on individual conditions and um, although we want to have information out there on all conditions that can affect people. It's interesting isn't it well, you mentioned Takotsubes. Takotsubes is uh, sort of called stress-induced cardiomyopathy you know and in some ways because more women sort of present with this condition you link stress in women, but actually the reality is it's more about the fact that they're women that, that this probably develops because a lot of men go through similar stresses, et cetera. And I think in some ways, again, rather than focusing on the fact that it's just about stress, because a lot of people don't describe an immediate stressor on the day that they get their event, you know, and they actually have to think back retrospectively and say, oh, you're saying it's due to stress. I'm going to think back and think about what stressful event happened and then link it to that, right? Because you ha I have to fit into your box. Uh, this I presented with this, it has to be stress. So I have to, and actually when you really talk to people, they say, no, I think it was just a normal day and it's happened to me. And again, that to my mind highlights the fact that it is something about female you know, physiology that may make them prone to certain things like this. And maybe we need to start thinking beyond what we know or what we think and start saying, well, actually, what is it? Maybe this is something which is um, to do with uh, hormonal change. Uh, maybe it's not just about stress. And I think that's where, uh, an initiative like yours would become so important. Uh, I, I, there are, are there any women's heart charities already around uh, in the UK or anywhere? Not, not, in, not in the UK. There are women's heart charities in America and in Australia that are specifically focused on, you know, supporting women. And those charities, I'm sure, were set up for similar sort of reasons to what we, why we want to set this charity up. That, that not enough focus on, you know, on um, women, women with heart disease, treat treatments and diagnosis, and you know, and and uh, sort of um, 
getting rid of that gender gap that there is at the moment that we know for certain in terms of outcomes for women, et cetera. So, and going back to what you were saying uh, about um, Takasubo, I mean, I had no stressful event, none whatsoever. I have been doing my same job for years. There was nothing. Exactly. And you are absolutely right. You then start to look back. Was it something that was being talked about in the meeting I was in? Was it uh, because I'd had a back problem several weeks before, you know, and you look, you look for that. And um, we on, on um, Takasubo Net, which is a, 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 um, a website for people specifically with Takasubo, there is um, a Takasubo wall where people have actually sort of written up what the cause or what they think the likely cause of their event was and unlike what you see in the papers or you know sort of generally where it talks about broken heart syndrome and this is mainly caused by a bereavement or a shock or something those people are in the minority i agree most people <laughs> most people don't really know what caused their event in the first place and then they start to put it down to an accumulation of stress because they're told it's to do with stress. So exactly. therefore, oh, I must have been, I've got all these things going on in my family, you know, maybe looking after disabled children, maybe you've got a partner who's ill, maybe you've got difficulties at work. And they put all that together, but then they don't think, well, I've been coping with that for the last 40 years. <laughs> you no, know, why is it suddenly happening now? So Yes, I think we need to move away from the fact that Takasubo is primarily thought to be triggered by um, an emotional event. You know? So, uh, and certainly, it very much is the minority that it is triggered by a death, which is you know what you see quite a lot in the in the media. Mm. I agree. I mean, I think the problem is that when you come to the patient and say, oh, it must be, this is due to stress, think back, think back. And then the patient, the poor patient will think back and say, well, this happened. And then that propagates this idea that, oh, it was stress. Here, look, there's another patient who's come in and she's had a stressful event. So this is a stress induced problem. Uh, and I think in some ways that's a little bit unfair because, as I say, it isn't that it is just that women can't handle stress. Everyone goes through stress. Everyone deals with it. In fact, women deal with more stress than men most of the time, and they deal with it very well indeed. So again, we have to start changing the dimensions of our boxes rather than trying to expect patients to fit in the box that we've created as doctors, I say. So I think that's... Um, interesting and I think that that would be that is certainly something that um, the medical profession needs to understand that we don't know everything and in some times there is no harm in acknowledging that because when we do acknowledge that then we start realizing that our textbooks do not hold all the answers this is a different world and maybe we should be reading our patients rather than reading the books maybe we should be listening to our patients and often the patients will give us the clue and but if you get like five minutes with a doctor who's already got a preconceived idea that, oh, you know, postmenopausal woman, she's at Takatsubo, Takatsubo gets back better in three months. A lot of them get stressed and they just keep complaining. Then, then you don't get in, you don't get a, uh, you don't even have a fighting chance when you have that. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited about the possibility that there may be the option of having more female cardiologists, and the fact that people are not only the public, but doctors are educated by patient experiences and patient stories, because I think ultimately that's what we're here for. We're here for the patient. We're not here for the diagnosis or our understanding of the diagnosis. Uh, so, I mean, tell me, a lot of people may be listening to this interview and they may have ideas on what a women's heart charity should look like, um, because I guess there may be so many unmet needs out there that we, you know, probably don't even know much about at this point in time. So if someone wanted to contact you with any ideas or wanted to be involved in the amazing work that you're doing or to talk to you about what other areas a charity like yours should focus on, uh, can they do that? And how do they do that? 
Yes, yes. Um, uh, anybody can um, contact me and I'd be very happy to receive any information. I mean, we're really keen to find out what women and, and their carers and their families, you know, would like from a charity that was specifically aimed at women and heart disease. Um, our contact details, um, there's, we have an email address, which is info mm -hmm. dot Women's mm -hmm. Heartbeat, which is all one word. So info.womensheartbeat at gmail.com. And, uh, you know, so if anybody wants to sort of write to us with their experiences, any difficulties they might have had, what they might like from the charity, if they're willing to sort of, you know, get involved, because obviously we're a fairly new charity. We're just getting off the ground. And uh, we'd be very, very happy to hear from anybody because we want the charity to be focused on the things that women with heart conditions want. We, you know, we, we don't want to just be an organization that has a website up there and doesn't do anything. You know, we want to be really active in the, um, in the charity sector. And as I said earlier, you know, really advocate for women. And in order to be able to do that, we need to have examples of women's stories and, you know, what they've been through uh, so that we can um, advocate on people's behalf and make things better. You're absolutely right. We need more qualitative research. You know, uh, it's one thing dealing with uh, figures, et cetera, but actually listening to people's stories and learning from that and seeing where the... Uh, I think I think that's sorely missing. So I think I think this is going to be very exciting. I'm I'm so glad you're doing this. Uh, I hope to uh, be a friend and uh, help in any way I can with the charity. Uh, and thank you so much for joining me. And I'd like to thank you for all that you're doing. And I wish you and the charity all the best. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for taking the time to, you know, put together this interview. It's uh, um, very grateful to be given the opportunity to talk a little bit. About and, you know, to, to let other women know out there that they're not alone. And what we've been experiencing, there are plenty of others who've experienced the same. And uh, yes, we're definitely going to try and listen to as many women as possible and make a difference in the future. Thank you so much.